Last time on HMS Ark Royal. There's a cracker that needs repairing. Welding will be necessary on the outer ship's bottom. We're about to start heading across the Atlantic. We've had the rug pulled away from us. All the cracks have been repaired. Jobs are good. Got the ship back, ready to go across the Atlantic uh, and catch up with our deployment. HMS Ark Royal is one of the world's most famous warships. But though the captain and crew don't know it, she's sailing into history. This series follows Britain's Royal Naval flagship on what will be her last deployment. And it's a starring role. Ark is to lead an international task force assembling at Norfolk, Virginia, the biggest naval base on Earth. And she's going the quickest way, the Great Circle route, which will take her to America through the iceberg hazards that sank the Titanic. For four days, she's been steaming at full speed, 21,000 tons of her at almost 30 knots. And despite the latest high-tech smooth coating on her hull, she's getting thirsty. Ark's planning to hook up for a RAS, a replenishment at sea of fuel, with a naval tanker almost as big as she is. The USS Wally Shira, named after the American astronaut, is an all-purpose naval supply vessel carrying fuel as well as other supplies. She's a new ship, launched in March 2009 and can carry around four and a half million liters of diesel. Back on Ark Royal, Chief Boson's mate Darren Bland is in charge of the replenishment. We're going to last about two and a half hours pumping this morning. We'll go alongside another ship. We'll fire gun lines across to make initial contact. And then we can transfer the hoses down so we can start pumping fuel between the two ships. To keep with the schedule, the ships will sail alongside each other at a steady 12 knots with eventually just one ship width between them. Very dangerous evolution. We're going along with two ships very close together. The guard valves are struck. We all have to have eyes in the boat, knowing exactly what everyone's doing all the time. The guidelines fired across from an SA-80 assault rifle, the same ones used by British infantrymen. The pulley cables are then secured between the ships and fastened to the right tension. Put the bail over! The refueling hose is capable of pumping over 7,000 litres a minute. That would refuel two cars every second. Wally and Ark have connected. But Darren and his team have to let the Americans know they're ready for pumping. Usually this is done with baton signals, similar to those used to guide planes at airports. Go check away! That's not an international bat signal, mate. Obviously the Americans don't know the international bat signal for start pumping. But Darren's got a solution. Is someone on those comms? Get someone on and tend to start pumping. Been a bit of confusion with the Razbat signals, but we've, we've worked out quite well because they've sent the comms across. The comms are working really well, so we're not relying on the bats. We can speak to the tanker and tell them exactly what we want to do. I need to know as soon as you're receiving fuel. What we've done, let's see, we've established connection. We've now got the hoses connected and we're starting to receive fuel. We're speaking to the tanker on the comms for them to increase or decrease the pressure of the fuel. Once we've received enough fuel, then we'll commence starting to pass back the hoses and the rest of the gear. 
It's normally considered far too dangerous for ships to travel this close. But in order for the refueling to be a success, these ships need to keep this up for two and a half hours. That's 80 kilometers. Any mistake could be catastrophic. We got enough fuel. Right, take the pen out and remove the remoting line. Okay, release the probe. There it goes, going now. Okay, copy it, slip! Up temporary guard row! Get rid of that telephone line! Right, all lines clear, free to manoeuvre. Right, pass runs complete. It went quite well. Again, a bit of confusion that they wanted one thing, we wanted another. But we got the message across in the end by shouting at each other, waving arms and things like that. Uh, but yeah, we got, the, we got all the stuff returned, no one got hurt, job was done safely. We've taken just over 800 tonnes, which has taken us back up to 95% capacity, so we're good to go now. Next round will be with the Fort George after we sail from Norfolk. As the ship makes her way towards Virginia, life on board continues as normal. However, damage control officer Whiskey Walker is planning something big. We're back at sea, it's time to raise the bar. So this afternoon what we're going to do is a main machinery space fire exercise. Notwithstanding a crash on deck, this is probably the worst incident that could happen to uh, a, a Royal Navy warship in peacetime. We need to get this done uh, to get back up to that level of operational readiness, ready for when we get over to the America. This is my job, setting fire to Her Majesty's flagship. Uh, every day of my life. For me, it doesn't get any better. It's the best job in the Royal Navy, uh, and I, I love my job. Hoo-ha! What we're doing is just making up casualties for this fire so that we can test the first aid as response, as well as the um, ship's company. The paramedics are hiding out in the ship's medical bay because they want their casualties to have maximum impact. It gives them a shock factor when they come into it. It just trains up the ship's company into realising that it could happen today, tomorrow, uh, even in a three years' time. It, you never know when it's going to happen, so it just gets them into the routine of fighting fires and treating casualties for real. And it's a very real threat. During the Falklands, HMS Sheffield and Sir Galahad were both hit, causing extreme fires. Over 70 men were lost across the two ships, and both sank. We're just going to be there as a bit of a hindrance to the initial attack. It's going to be burns because we're, we're having a uh, machinery space fire. This here is just um, a really cheap way of making the hands look like they've blistered up, so we just get some Vaseline and some tissue paper and just put it over the top. The first aid has popped them. It actually pops with something so that they've got the effect there of trying to be careful not to pop the blisters. That's it. Our two casualties here are now ready to go and lay down and scream. Lots of noise. Oh, yeah. Coming up. <laughs> things heat up in the engine room. They've got to vacate the compartment. And Ark reaches Norfolk in Virginia. He said that the naval base was big, but well, didn't expect it to be this big. HMS Ark Royal's damage control officer, Whiskey Walker, is about to set off a massive fire drill. But most of the ship's company will think it's for real. What we're going to do now is go down the main machinery space. We're going to initiate the exercise from down there. The casualties are already going to be down there. The incident will get too big, and then that will drive the ship along with the fact that we've got casualties to emergency stations. The fire's well underway, with a little help from a smoke machine. I 
19-year-old Juliet Millard's a steward and trainee medic. This is the foreign control point. It's where everything to do with the incident happens. All the attack party are coming down now, trying to fight the fire. Um, if there are any casualties, they'll be brought out now. So this is where it's all going on, basically. They've got to get the casualties out before the temperature rises. They've got just minutes. Red light. That red light indicates we're just about to operate the first shot of BTM, which is a halon, into the compartment to attempt to extinguish the fire. BTM, short for bromo trifluoromethane, is a gaseous fire repression system that launches into the compartment. If the gas can occupy 5% of the machine room's atmosphere, it will reduce the oxygen in the fire and eventually extinguish it. But the gas can be hazardous to humans. So if they're not wearing breathing apparatus, they've got to vacate the compartment. The red light warning means the team must evacuate in 60 seconds. Get out of the way, guys! Cash ain't coming through! She's heading his back, guys! Come on! Go down, guys! Mate, you can leave to help yourself up! Well done, mate, you're doing really, really well! At this point, the whole of this compartment will be smoke logged. Uh, we've got two people down there using a centrifuge hose reel. They've got a thermal imaging camera. They're going to attempt to keep fighting the fire. At that point, the fire will escalate. We will beat them out. Back. Edge back. Slowly edge back. Yeah? It's Juliet's moment to prove her first aid skills. Okay, mate. <laughs> Do you want to start checking his airway? Yeah. Just open your mouth for me, mate. Oh. Right, his airway is clear. We've got this casualty, so now we're just moving him away from where all the action's going on to the nearest first aid post. He's got cool bandages on his face to cool the bands on his face and his chest. Burns bags on his hands, which stop the infection on his hands. So that's a subutal inhaler, which opens up his airway, helps him to breathe. It's just a bit, like, quick. Everything happens really quick, so it's like, oh. Speed is essential. 95% uh, of all fires in the Royal Navy are extinguished by the person who discovers them or members of the initial attack party. OK, good you can. Where's that last team? The PVI gold suits which the guys are wearing are capable of withstanding temperatures up to 400 degrees. They're used for the most serious fires aboard. I can confirm that this fire has been extinguished. We've operated both shots of BTM and the multi-spray system. This is the best firefighting system fitted to this warship. Current temperature in that compartment is 55 degrees centigrade and falling. Your mission, your mission is to re-enter the forward gear room and reclaim that space for your captain and your shipmates. Firefighting and damage control is, is, is a perishable skill, and we've really got to keep on top of it all the time. Uh, and if we don't, people tend to forget about it. They go off the boil. They lose that little bit of an edge that we need when we're at sea and we're operational. But we've proved what we needed to prove. We've set up. We've made the re-entry into the compartment. We've reclaimed the compartment. Everyone's pleased with the way it went, but for one of the casualties, the agony was more than acting. They had to drag me out of the way, out through the ladders that made machinery space with the, uh, with the fire hose. Which is one of the most painful experiences I've ever had in my life. So that's going to take two or three days to ease off. Brilliant day at the office, but just another day at the office. Yeah, it all starts again tomorrow. The Lynx helicopters returned from a routine test flight and is ready to collect trainee winchman Gareth Edwards for the biggest test of his Navy career. 
bit nervous, to be honest with you. It's my first winch cereal on board, and of course, fleet carry as well, hate my sack oil. Gareth and his buddy have to kit out in their immersion suits, as the sea temperature's around 15 degrees. It's been a while since Gareth's tried one on. I can't get the suit on. <laughs> I need um, a packing stick and a good friend just to kind of bend my arm in. That's it. Where is it? All right, keep going. You're not getting in this anymore. I am, I am. Come on, keep pulling, keep pulling. Ah, that doesn't help me shoulder. Pull, they got me. It's a boy. <laughs> and then, that's how you do it, see? That's the way to do it. Which one, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We are angels on a wire. I mean, we're there to save people's lives if things go wrong. The Lynx is primarily a fast combat helicopter, but it's so maneuverable, it's ideal for search and rescue. Winchmen have to be able to rescue from a winch length of around 75 meters. But for Gareth's debut, he'll be winching from under 10. But he's got to take account of the pitch and roll of the ship. At the moment, the arc's rise and fall is almost twice his own height. Gareth's next challenge is to recover his buddy safely into the aircraft. The Westland Lynx is one of the fastest helicopters in the world, but in these situations it's a very sensitive machine and requires great pilot skill. The next test is to put them both back safely on the flight deck. It's a more difficult procedure, because they're fighting the helicopter's downdraft. With the winch load heavier, the helicopter's downdraft is fiercer. Gareth has to get the timing right, so they both touch down safely. Well, before I was nervous, but I've got to admit, the adrenaline took over that. It's a hard job. I mean, the task as a whole is winching is a hard job. But I've, I've got to admit now, I'm confident that if it was to turn out to a real life time scenario, I'd be more than happy and more than confident to save lives. The following morning, excitement's in the air. Ark Royals only moments from dry land, the first they've seen for seven days, and Captain John Clink's at the helm. Here we are arriving in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, the, uh, the world's largest naval base, and you can see that from the uh, impressive array of um, US Navy warships in the background. And uh, we're used to uh, going around most of the world as, the, as a fairly large aircraft carrier, but here we're certainly um, put in our place by the might of the US Navy. 
I'm certainly very pleased that they're our number one coalition ally. Norfolk Naval Base covers around 12 square kilometers, with its waterfront stretching across six and a half kilometers. It can berth 78 ships and is home to some of the world's largest aircraft carriers, such as the USS Theodore Roosevelt and the USS Harry Truman, whose 335 meter flight deck is twice the length of Ark Royal and as long as the Empire State Building is tall. Size matters. Norfolk's also home to the USS Enterprise, the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Its sheer size has taken some members of the ship's company by surprise. Massive, <laughs> bloody huge. Got lost on this thing when I first joined it, sod that. Amazing, unbelievable the size of them. It's just, it's incredible. It looks like a hotel, do you know what I mean? They said the, the naval basement was big, but didn't expect it to be this big. Yeah. Definitely beats uh, Portsmouth. <laughs> While Ark's in Norfolk, she'll be embarking 140 US Marines. They're the engineers to support the US Harriers that'll be landing on Ark once she's out at sea for an operation called Capella Strike. Very excited about the US Marine Corps arriving. They have the AV-8B, which is a type of Harrier aircraft. They're going to bring 12. It's going to make the deck very busy. It's going to be challenging, but I'm really looking forward to it, and it'll be a great opportunity to see how they operate and really test the deck in Ark Royal, ready for one squadron embarking uh, later in the deployment. We feel the buzz around the ship at the moment. You know, everyone wants to come on the upper deck, see where we are, see what it looks like. Um, you know, and um, so this is what uh, it's what they all join the Navy for. Coming up, the top brass of the US Navy toast Ark Royal. Training with the British Navy is the way to go. And extreme conditions test her flight deck. Put more wheel on. Put more wheel on. HMS Ark Royal's been moored up in Norfolk US Naval Base for three days. And the Virginia weather's taken a turn for the worse. In the hangar, ARCs embarked the Marine Corps engineers, who will be looking after 12 US Harrier jump jets when they join for the next stage of the deployment. Okay, so on, sir. Uh, jet, uh, this morning, what we'll be doing for the next 45 minutes is we'll be showing you uh, certain points within the hangar uh, that you'll be using throughout your time aboard HMS Ark Corps. While the engineers get used to their new home, ARC throws a party. The American guests arrive dead on time, 1,900 hours. Sir, request permission to come aboard. Absolutely, good pleasure. <laughs> well, it's fun, Rob, behind the uh, XO. Ah, well, a very well, welcome aboard. Very on. nice to meet you. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. At the top of the gangway, they're awaiting this evening's VIP, US Vice Admiral Williams, commander of the Second Fleet of the US Navy. Yeah, we're waiting for the American Admiral to arrive, and uh, he's going to get the full set of ceremonial, so I'm here to uh, ugle him on. So, I don't really know who he is, I just get told to turn up and play an Admiral on, so... tonight to have fun and uh, although the weather is somewhat uh, cloudy and rainy on the inside on board the Ark Royal it's sunny <laughs> this is truly a wonderful opportunity for the United Kingdom the United States to operate together the reception stuffed with the top brass of the US Navy like Rear Admiral Gary White commander of the US Strike Force 
obviously, if we ever go to hostilities anywhere around the world, in all likelihood, it will occur as part of a coalition. And there's no stronger coalition than the United States and the UK. Training with the British Navy is the way to go. There is no question in our mind on that. At 2100 hours precisely, the reception's over, drawn to an end in true naval tradition by lowering the Queen's colours. Guard! Halt! Guard! Into line! Left! Turn! Out! It's time for the guests to leave. There's a busy day ahead. We've got to hit the ground running tomorrow. We've got the US Marine Corps uh, engineers already embarked, and tomorrow we'll see the arrival of the 12 AV AV8B uh, Harrier jet. So it's going to be busy tomorrow, and we're sailing early in the morning, and we need to be uh, you know, ready to go, uh, ready to get on with the next stage of the exercise. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. You guys did a wonderful job. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye-bye now. Arc set sail from Norfolk Naval Base at 6 a.m. Slow ahead, both engines. The plan is to embark the 12 AV-8B US Harrier jets. They're flying in from Cherry Point Air Base in North Carolina. Stay on one, two, six. But there's a problem. So we're just coming out of Norfolk now. The issues we've got this morning is the weather is slightly different to its forecast. The low pressure's moved further east because the winds have switched around by 180 degrees. The low pressure and the associated warm fronts with it are moving out to the northeast and we're going that way. So hopefully, and actually if you look down there to the south, it does look a bit better. So we're heading south to try and get out of this weather so we can get the jets back on board. Hopefully it should improve. It's not the weather we were expecting for Norfolk. It feels very much like getting out of Portsmouth at the moment. As the ship changes course in search of better weather, Ark Royal's chief weather forecaster, Lieutenant Commander Andy Jacob, is trying to work out the best place to embark the jets. Right, the current situation we've got at the moment, as you can see, we've got a low pressure system lying over the eastern seaboard, pretty much over the top of Norfolk. So what we're going to see as we move down to the southwest, as we move the ship, is those, uh, those cloud bases improving, the visibility improving. We're currently situated up in this area here, and as the frontal system moves out to the east, you can see the gaps starting to open up along the eastern seaboard and see um, some improvement in the cloud base on the visibility. The fact that we can move fairly rapidly to different areas in order to get that clear air that we need, that's the distinct advantage that the aircraft carrier has over shore bases. As the ship steams south, the helicopters continue their flying program. They can operate with a minimum cloud base of 30 meters, whereas the US jets require 300 meters to land safely, as it's their first time flying onto ARC. The ship's duty navigator has a vital role, launching and recovering aircraft. Speed, pitching for roll. If pitching for, in for show, ship has correct, give the green. Ed Rees joined ARC Royal two weeks ago. He's just graduated from Dartmouth Naval College. Really happy that you know we are on. I'm on the flagship, and we're representing the UK. You know, across and everyone's heard of the Art Royal in, in the UK. I told all of my uh, all my friends, my family. You know, they asked what what money what money ship was, and I told them the Art Royal. And said, oh, yeah, I heard of that it's aircraft carrier. You know, there's definitely a good sense of pride that, that we're on the right. Ed's on board the Ark for six months, training to be a navigator. One zero one. 35 knots. This is, this is very much just a professional stage of my training that I need to get cracked. And all of this flying is great training. It's again a good opportunity to do an art wall. Um, you know, just, just dealing with things. The transit across the state, you know, not a lot of shipping, not a lot going on, but then the flying certainly keeps you really busy. And there's no time for Ed to rest. There are helicopters waiting to land, and the US Harrier jets are on their way. The visibility is very poor, and it's Ed's first time taking charge of the ship during a landing.
The ship's navigator, Giles Palin, is standing by to supervise Ed. Come back round, up speed, back on the nav track, and then there's just the things to get on there, and hopefully we should be able to try and do that down the nav track. As an officer watch, you've got to uh, uh, get the ship on the right course, which, take, which gets the, uh, the correct relative wind over the deck. Now, each helicopter has a different safe operating limit, different parameters by which you have to get the wind within and land it on. So when you're talking about two different helicopters at the same time, that makes the puzzle that much harder. First in is the Lynx, weighing just over three tonnes, about the same as three small cars. The helicopter approaches the deck from the side, using the ship's superstructure as a reference to land. But the crosswind can be dangerous, especially for such a light aircraft. Slow head both. Slow head both. So Ed's got to slow the ship down and steer her into the wind. At this speed, you can put more wheel on. Put more wheel on. Check quarters. Starboard. Any helicopter, however heavy, can only land on the deck if the movement is less than two degrees of pitch and five of roll. Next to recover is the Merlin. With a full crew, it weighs in at 14 tonnes, much heavier. So this aircraft needs more wind to land. Yeah, what's the wind speed? 30. Yeah, give him a call on 214. Ed increases arc speed to get 35 knots of wind across the deck. But will it be enough? We do push the young officers quite hard on here, so this is just a, a, a tiny little taste of what's to come. That was a good effort by Ed. He's uh, only been on board for two weeks. Uh, so two weeks in, and he's landing on two helicopters in pretty poor conditions. The visibility was right down, and the winds were quite strong. Yeah, it's quite good, sort of seeing it all come together. And uh, yeah, no, I'm quite happy with it, I have to say. Uh, I, feel, I feel quite good. In search of clear skies, HMS Ark Royal sailed 150 kilometers south of her planned rendezvous with the US Harrier jets. But the cloud base isn't shifting. Weather, unfortunately, has not been good enough uh, for us to bring the Harriers on, the, the US Marine Corps Harriers on, uh, safely this afternoon. Hopefully the weather will be better tomorrow. We'll get the Harriers embarked safely and continue from there. That is all. Clearly, weather is a big factor when we're trying to uh, fly aircraft uh, from the carrier. And because a lot of the pilots who will be flying on tomorrow haven't done this before, they haven't come to the ship before, uh, then we must make sure that the conditions are absolutely correct uh, for them to do that. And uh, so it's a bit frustrating for us. Um, we've been uh, here all day flying helicopters, but the weather isn't good enough to fly fixed wing aircraft. Um, so we'll uh, early night tonight and uh, see what comes up tomorrow. Coming up. The Americans arrive in force. HMS Ark Royal sailed through the night, and she's now 300 kilometers south of the original rendezvous point for embarking the US jets. Yesterday we had problems with uh, weather at the ship and the cloud base was too low to make the, uh, the, the guys coming from ashore to make a safe recovery. But what we've done now is we've managed to find a nice clear piece of airspace where we know when they come to us they can land on safely. The trick now is to stay in this nice area, we've got some good weather, we stay here and, uh, and continue through the afternoon. The jets will be stationed aboard Ark Royal for the next 10 days. It's going to be a busy time for everyone. The 12 AV-8B Harriers will be embarking on more than 40 flights every day, pushing the ship's company to their limits. We're going to be a busy deck, lots of jets working up, lots of helicopters trying to work at the same time within a task group. 
that's key to um, what the whole deployment's about, is coming out to work as a task group away from the UK. The AV-8B Harrier jet, similar to the Royal Navy's GR-9 Harrier, with the addition of a long-range radar and five-barreled Gatling gun, which can fire 65 rounds a second. The plane's thrust capacity is enough to support more than 11 tons of its own weight fully loaded. It can fly above 15,000 meters at speeds of 1,000 kilometers an hour. The US Marine Corps have been flying Harriers for 25 years. They're the most forward deployed tactical strike aircraft in combat. They're famous for being as reliable as they are deadly. Get your off. In 1991, throughout Operation Desert Storm, they achieved an aircraft readiness rate greater than 90%. One of the most efficient war machines in history. It's a bit of a baptism of fire. This is a, a two-week period of time that we've waited for for an awful long time, from since last year, actually. I think the whole plan is just to relish it and enjoy it and make the most of, the, of, of working with the Marine Corps. Finally, all the US Harriers are now safely aboard HMS Ark Royal. Making up for lost time, the Marine Corps jets get straight to work. And Captain Frankie Parisi is about to show off their firepower. We'll be uh, taking off from the ship and they have uh, a strafing target that's going to be towed about 600 meters behind the boat. And we'll be employing our practice bombs and uh, practice rounds of our 25 millimeter gun. And this is definitely one of the uh, better exercises that we actually get to do. About 100 meters left. We've just put an alarm target in the water. The target itself is only approximately about a meter uh, in width and height. I haven't seen one being hit as yet. Uh, they've come pretty close a few times, but uh, not as yet. Nobody's hit it. So Frankie could be about to make history. It's all mine now. Frankie's aiming to hit the splash target with practice bombs as well as live rounds from the jet's machine gun. And what we have here is a Bru 42 triple ejector rack. It carries three bombs on the one bomb station. What it's carrying right now is uh, three Mark 76 practice bombs. It's a, it's a 25 pound inert bomb and it's carrying a signal cartridge which emits smoke once it hits the target. Over here, we have the GAO-12. It's a 25-millimeter Gatlin gun. It emits 4,000 rounds a minute of 25-millimeter targets. Frankie's boss, Lieutenant Colonel T.J. Dunn, is watching the action from the quarter deck. They're flying a pattern that we're not used to flying because the target's moving. It's only about a four-foot by four-foot sled but we're not usually going for something that small. The tank is maybe 26 feet long. This is a 4x4 four four target. As you can imagine with what's going on out in the Indian Ocean with the Somali pirates, uh, being able to shoot at small craft moving quickly through the water is imperative, and it's a skill set that the Marine Expeditionary Unit has to have with it. If they come back and they've shot the target off, it'll be a happy day. The Americans will definitely be going after it. So I want that record. That's what we're hoping for. 
I want you to know, point out the Americans on your side if I can't hit the target. Frankie's first attack will be from an altitude of 750 meters at a speed of 900 kilometers an hour with his Mark 76 practice bombs. These have the same characteristics as 1,000 pound bombs. With the bombs deployed, Frankie has one more chance of hitting the target. He'll use the jet's five barrel 25 caliber rotating machine gun. You're getting a nice accurate burst, one to one and a half second burst, about 50 to 60 round burst a ton, but even then you're gonna have a hard time guiding on something moving 30 knots like that. Frankie drops his altitude to 600 meters. 05 4.1 pullback. You see the bullets before you hear the sound, but that's because the bullet is tra traveling faster than the speed of sound. Quite smart to watch. The bullets are traveling at 10 times faster than the speed of sound, and three and a half thousand meters a second. I'll be very impressed if they've hit it. Absolutely. But um, I'm not all that much old. The machine gun's operated by a 15 horsepower electric motor and is capable of firing 100 rounds in one and a half second bursts. That's 4,000 rounds a minute. In war, the rounds would have armor piercing incendiary heads to cause maximum damage. They can easily take out a tank. Well, they look like they've got pretty close, but you can't really tell from here. bring in the uh, alarm target back in board, and then we can find out whether they've actually hit the target or not. So, yeah, I'm quite interested. Oh, it was a blast, absolute blast. Uh, five rounds with the gun, two rounds with the 76s. It was a good time. The exercise over, the jury awaits. Um, just the old bullet holes. Um, you don't see there appear to be any new bullet holes in there. Nothing new to add, I'm afraid. Better look next time. I had the first gun run in every odd number. Do you remember how those were? Uh, you missed. Everything got closer, nobody yeah. hit. I would definitely hit the water. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was hoping <laughs> I hit the water at least. <laughs> Thanks. Sir. So this is the target. I actually thought it was much bigger than this. And if we had actually hit it with any number of rounds, anything significant, it would have broken the wood into smithereens. So we did actually uh, break it like we thought we would. Maybe we'll say that was just a direct hit, even though it uh, looks like the bolt for a screw. Certainly makes me feel a little better, I guess, to know that nobody else has ever hit it. Dude, maybe before I even get off the ship, I'll get one more crack at it. Next time on HMS Ark Royal. I mean, look at this. Weather is absolutely perfect. Well, you miss. Doesn't get any better, does it? Today is my first ever takeoff and landing on a ship. Ark Royal and the Marine Corps have learned a great deal from each other. We could go to war off the ship easily. The spotlight's on, so I'm just going to have to man up. Really. Is that the weather? Two five five. On the way along.